Late on the night of May 27, 1995, a long-haul truck driver named Devin Williams pulled his gigantic refrigerated semi-truck into a truck stop in a city called Kingman, Arizona. After putting his truck in a park, Devin reached over and grabbed his sleeping bag off the passenger seat and began to unroll it. Devin would normally get out and use the bathroom and brush his teeth before going to sleep for the night. But this night, Devin was so exhausted that instead of going in, he just unfurled that sleeping bag and then climbed behind the front two seats of his truck and got into what's called the sleeper cab, which is an area behind the front two seats in the cab where drivers can lay down and rest. Devin had been on the road for the last four days, basically nonstop, and all he wanted to do was just finish the stupid route and get back home to his wife, Mary Lou, and their three kids in the tiny town of Americus in Kansas. Devin hated being away from his family for long periods of time, which unfortunately was part of his job being a long haul truck driver but they needed the money because he and his wife had just bought a new house and it was a total fixer upper. And so they needed to do a whole bunch of repairs to turn that house into a home. And so missing his family and just wishing he was done with this route, Devin laid in his sleeping bag in the sleeper cab trying to fall asleep, but he just couldn't. And unfortunately, as Devin knew, if he didn't sleep this night, then he would have to take another break later on on this route to rest because he couldn't just continue to drive with absolutely no sleep. And so taking an additional break that he was not prepping for could affect his ability to get home on time. It was Saturday night and the strawberries and lettuce that Devin was hauling inside of his truck were due in Kansas City, Missouri, 1300 miles away on Monday morning. And so Devin began doing the math in his head. If he stopped a little while later to take another sleep break, would he still be able to cover those 1300 miles by Monday? And he just wasn't sure. Everybody at the trucking company where Devin worked knew the 29 year old as being very easygoing and good natured. Trucking was very hard. People drove insanely long hours on very little sleep. And some people even took drugs to stay awake even longer to make sure they hit their deadlines. And so truckers have kind of earned the reputation of being very rough and tough people. And Devin certainly looked rough and tough. He was this big guy who wore cowboy hats. He had a big Fu Manchu mustache. He had tattoos. But in reality, despite how he looked, he was actually like a gentle giant. And really all he talked about were his kids, who he was totally devoted to. The only time anyone at this company saw Devin get mad was when his work interfered with his ability to see his family. And now as Devin tossed and turned inside of a sleeper cab, he was getting mad because he was thinking this stupid route and his inability to sleep during this particular break was very likely going to interfere with seeing his family. And after an hour of Devin getting angrier and angrier and so not sleeping at all, he finally just gave up on sleep. He chucked his sleeping bag, he climbed out of the cab and he headed into the truck stop where he went to the bathroom, he got a bite to eat and then he called his boss and he told Told him that he had just made a stop in order to sleep, but he couldn't. And so he was just going to hit the road again. But don't worry, even though I need another break in order to sleep, I will be in Kansas City on Monday morning with this delivery on time. After speaking to his boss, Devin left the truck stop, climbed back into his truck, he fired it up, and then before long, he was back on the highway driving east. Devin's boss was a guy named Tom Wilson, and he didn't find anything unusual about this phone call he got from Devin. Maybe it was a little unusual that Devin was unable to sleep and that he called his boss to say he was unable to sleep, but Devin sounded totally normal. And so that night, Tom was not worried at all that Devin would not make it to Kansas City by Monday morning. Devin was like one of his most reliable guys. And so if Devin said he was gonna be there on Monday morning, even if he needed extra breaks along the way, then he would be there on Monday morning. But on Monday morning, the distribution center in Kansas City, Missouri, where Devin was supposed to go and drop off the lettuce and strawberries, called Tom Wilson and they said, hey, your driver's not here yet. What's going on? Now, at first, Tom was actually really annoyed with the distribution center because he felt like, okay, the clock has just struck the deadline. Devin will likely arrive in the next few minutes and they're prematurely calling to complain. And so Tom communicated that to the distribution center and they said, okay, fine, we'll wait a little bit longer. But when almost an hour passed and still Devin had not shown up, the distribution center called Tom back and said, hey, 
He's not here. Now, after the second call, Tom totally changed his mindset, and he was actually now worried about Devin. And so he apologized to the distribution center and said he would get in touch with Devin as soon as he could and figure out where their shipment was. But Tom couldn't just call Devin and ask where he was and what was going on, because this was back in 1995. They didn't have cell phones, and so Tom basically just had to wait for Devin, who's out on the road somewhere, to stop somewhere and call Tom to tell Tom what's going on. And so all day Monday, Tom sat at his desk waiting for a call from Devin. And when he didn't get a call from Devin, Tom began calling his other drivers all over the country, asking them if maybe they had had some sort of interaction with Devin and knew where he was and why he had not made it to Kansas City on time but none of the drivers had any idea what was going on with Devin. No one had spoken to him. Then that evening, Tom got a call, but it was not from Devin. It was from Devin's wife, Mary Lou. And she was calling to say, where's Devin? He was supposed to be home by now and he's not. I haven't heard from him in days. What's going on? And at this, Tom suddenly thought, okay, we have a real problem here. And so when Tom explained to Mary Lou what was going on with Devin, how he had missed this deadline, Mary Lou panicked and immediately called the police. A little while later, a police officer in America's Kansas arrived at Mary Lou's house to take down the missing person report. And after they did that, the deputy assured Mary Lou that very likely her husband would be found and he would be just fine. And so they explained to Mary Lou that what they would do is put out an alert to all the different police departments that fell kind of roughly along the route that Devin's truck had been on and see if any of them had had some sort of interaction with Devin. You know, maybe he got into an accident, maybe his truck broke down and he was stranded somewhere, you know, maybe he was hospitalized, who knows? But very likely one of these police departments would know where Devin was. And sure enough, after this alert went out, the officer got a call back very quickly from a sheriff's department in a place called Coconino County, Arizona. Coconino County was located 200 miles to the east of Kingman, Arizona, which was where Devin had been on Saturday night, but couldn't sleep and then called his boss to say he was going to hit the road again. But interestingly, the sheriff's department in Coconino County made it very clear to the police officer in America's Kansas that they had no idea where Devin was but they definitely knew where his truck was. In fact, basically everybody in Coconino County knew where Devin's truck was. It was all anybody in that county was talking about. Because on Sunday, so the day before Devin was reported missing, somebody driving Devin's truck spent the entire day terrorizing hikers and campers inside of the Tonto National Forest in Coconino County. The Tonto National Forest, which is 600,000 acres of just rugged wilderness preserve, was nowhere near Devon's trucking route. In fact, it wasn't near any trucking route ever. It's like 20 miles off of the highway and the roads in the forest are barely wide enough to support small cars going through, let alone a 48 foot long, massive 10 ton semi-truck like Devon was driving. But on Sunday morning, so roughly eight hours after Devon had called his boss, Tom, Two hikers named Lynn and Jack Yarrington were in their tent inside of Tonto National Forest, just having a nice time. It's peaceful, it's quiet, and they're right near this dirt road that kind of bent around a corner. And suddenly they began to hear a rumbling sound coming from one end of this road. And so they were in their tent, they unzipped it, they looked out, and at first all they saw on the road coming in their direction was this huge cloud of dust and smoke. And then through the dust and smoke came Devin's human humongous truck blazing down this road at practically full speed. And at first, Jack and Lynn are like, how is this truck even in the forest? How did it get here? How did it actually manage to drive to this point? And after Devin's truck whizzed past them and blazed off in the other direction out of sight, Lynn and Jack weren't scared or worried. They were just totally confused. And so they began speculating, you know, like, well, maybe the driver got lost and they're trying to find a place to turn around or something. And sure enough, a couple of minutes later, they heard a rumbling sound and they saw another cloud of dust and it was Devin's truck now coming back in the other direction on the same dirt road. And so Jack and Lynn, they kind of backed up behind their tent and they watched as this truck blazed past them again, flying out the other direction. And so in some ways that kind of confirmed to Lynn and Jack that yes, 
you know, this driver, who's definitely driving recklessly at this point, has likely gotten lost, they've managed to turn around, and now they're heading back out to the highway, and that's all this was. And then all of a sudden, as they're kind of chatting about it and laughing about it, they hear the sound of the truck coming back again. And they look up, and sure enough, there's Devin's truck barreling down the road again. Except this time, Jack and Lynn, they looked where Devin's truck was going, and they saw there was a small sedan coming up the road in the opposite direction. So Devin and the sedan are going to collide, and because this road was actually on a turn, the driver of the sedan couldn't actually see the truck, and the driver of the truck, whether it was Devin or somebody else, couldn't see the sedan. And so both drivers are driving towards each other without realizing it, and so Jack and Lynn, they jump up, they begin screaming and yelling at the driver of the truck to slow down, but the truck didn't slow down. It just continued coming down the road. And the sedan driver, he saw Jack and Lynn flailing their arms and trying to get somebody to stop on the road. And so sensing there was another car, the sedan came to a full stop. And then right in front of them, they saw this truck come barreling around the road. And so the sedan began backing up wildly, trying to get out of the way of this huge truck. And then finally, the driver of the sedan just cut the wheel and peeled off the side of the road into the brush. And right as they did, the truck which had not slowed down at all, even though the driver could have clearly seen the sedan, just whizzed right past the sedan and would have smashed into it if the sedan had not jumped off the road. The driver of the sedan got out of the car and when Jack and Lynn ran up to him to make sure he was okay, he would tell them that he got a good look at the driver of the truck as he drove past him and he told them that the driver was just gripping the wheel looking totally straight ahead, no expression whatsoever, just barreling past him. It was like he didn't even look at the sedan, he was just going. A little later that day, and not far from where this incident had just happened on this road with Jack and Lynn and the sedan, there was this family that was hiking through Tonto National Forest, and they had arrived at this big, beautiful open field in the middle of the forest, and they planned to have a picnic in this field. But as they came out of the tree line and walked into this beautiful, open, high grass meadow area, they looked out and they saw just kind of in the middle of the field was this huge truck that made no sense. How in the world could this truck have gotten to this meadow? They didn't know. But they clearly saw there's a truck and the father of the family he saw there was a man standing next to this truck, just kind of looking away from them off at the mountains in the distance. And so this family kind of assumed that the driver of this truck had somehow gotten into this meadow and maybe their truck was stuck and so now they need help. And so the father told his family to stay put for a second and then he, on his own, walked across the meadow towards this truck. And as the father got closer, he did see that very clearly the truck was stuck in the mud. And so this driver very likely is stranded. And so as he got close enough, the father yelled out to this guy and said, hey, do you need some help? You know, we can go back and call someone, you know, what can we do for you? But the man who was standing outside of the truck didn't even turn around to talk to this father. He just kept standing there motionless, looking off into the distance. And so the father made it about five or six feet away from this guy. And the father just stopped and very clearly said, hey, I'm talking to you. Do you need help? And at this point, the man who was standing next to the truck, he turned around and he looked at the father. And immediately the father kind of backed up for a second because there was something off about this guy. The guy was just kind of standing there and he was staring at the father and he opened his mouth like he was about to speak. But instead of speaking, he just kept opening his mouth wider and wider until it was as wide as he could get it. And then he began wiggling his lower jaw back and forth as fast as he could and then clicking his teeth simultaneously. And so the father just began backing up like there was something wrong with this guy. And right as the father was about to just turn around and leave and go protect his family from this guy, the guy stopped with his mouth and then he just stared directly at the father and said very calmly, I didn't do it, they did it. Now, when the father heard this, he was already so weirded out by this guy that he didn't even have any questions to follow up with. Instead, he just turned and began running back towards his family. And so feeling very unsettled, the family, they ran back to their car, they drove back home, and they called the police about this guy and his truck. 
It would take a deputy from the Coconino County Sheriff's Department a little while to finally navigate their way all the way out to this meadow where this truck and this guy apparently were. And when the deputy got there, they walked out into this meadow and sure enough, just like the father had said, there was the truck stuck in the mud. And so the deputy began walking out to the truck expecting to see the driver, this guy who the father had said was acting totally weird. But when the deputy got up there, he found the truck was totally abandoned. There was nobody in the cab, there was nobody nearby, it was just sitting here, but it was still running. And so the deputy tried to open up the cab, but it was locked. He did look inside and everything looked very neat and orderly. And then he went around to the back of the truck and he opened up the back doors and he found the refrigeration unit was still on. And inside of this truck was lots and lots of strawberries and lettuce. So the deputy really didn't know what to make of this truck in the middle of the field, combined with this report that the father gave about the guy who was standing near it, acting totally weird. And so he just checked the license plate of the truck and he ran it against his database to see if there were any matching reports of missing trucks or missing truck drivers but there weren't any because remember this is on Sunday this is happening and it wasn't until the next day Monday that Devin was reported missing and his truck was added to a list of missing trucks and missing truck drivers and so the Coconino County deputy just called a towing company who came out and hauled Devin's truck out of the forest And then 24 hours later, when Devin was reported missing, the Coconino County Sheriff's Department put it all together and contacted the officer in Americus, Kansas to say, okay, we do have Devin's truck, but we don't have any other answers for you. The behavior of the man who was driving Devin's truck through Tonto National Forest was so insanely out of character for someone like Devin that it seemed totally impossible that Devin could have done this. But both Lynn and Jack Yarrington and the other people who saw this truck flying through the forest on that Sunday, they all insisted that the man they saw in the cab driving this truck matched the picture of Devin Williams. But there was absolutely no reason for why Devin would want to go to the Tonto National Forest. And even if he did want to go to this forest for some reason, he should have known that his massive semi-trailer truck was not a good choice to be driving around these narrow dirt roads in the middle of this wilderness preserve. All we know about Devin is that at the time he went missing, all he likely wanted to do was just get home to America's Kansas to be with his wife and three kids again. That's really all he cared about. The police did consider that, you know, maybe Devin just ran away. But that theory didn't add up. Devin had no criminal record. He had a great relationship with his wife, so there were no issues there. And there were no other kind of outstanding relationship issues with friends or family. And financially, even though it was a little tight, they were doing just fine. They just wanted some extra money to fix up this house and make it really nice. It wasn't like they were struggling to put food on the table. Also, the police considered that, you know, maybe Devin was kidnapped or something. But Devin is like this big, imposing, tattooed, cowboy hat, big mustache, tough truck driver. I mean, who's going to try to kidnap that guy? Devin also had no medical issues. He wasn't struggling with his mental health. He had no neurological abnormalities. He also never used drugs and always passed every single drug test that he got while working for this trucking company. Devin was basically just this totally normal, nice, well-adjusted guy with nothing to run or hide from. And so none of this made any sense. Police mounted a massive search inside of Tonto National Forest. And during the search, the couple, Jack and Lynn Yarrington, who had seen the truck barreling up and down the road and nearly collide with that sedan, they would tell searchers that they actually thought they saw Devin Williams, not in his truck, but out on foot walking around on Monday morning. So just hours before he would have been reported missing, they said they just saw this guy wandering barefoot down the road as they were driving out of the forest. And they slowed down to ask him if he was okay. And this guy who looked exactly like Devin Williams responded by picking up a rock and throwing it at their car. And so Jack and Lynn just drove past him, not realizing that this was the guy who very likely was driving that truck. Now, the police, when they began this search, were pretty confident they would find Devin, especially after hearing from Jack and Lynn that he was pretty likely on foot and without shoes walking around the forest. It seemed like he could not get very far. But despite this huge search, 
they could not find Devin. There was absolutely no trace of him. And so after nearly three weeks of searching and not finding Devin, the police called off the search. Then on May 2nd, 1997, so almost exactly two years from when Devin had been reported missing, Two hikers were walking on this trail in the middle of Tonto National Forest, right in the area where police had extensively searched for Devon two years earlier. These two hikers, they're walking on this trail and up ahead they see there's this white thing right in the middle of the trail, just kind of sitting out. Now, this is a well-trafficked trail and so they're wondering, you know, what is this thing? And so they walk up and they see this white thing is a perfectly intact human skull. There's no skeleton, it's just the skull. And so these hikers, they gasp, they can't believe they're looking at a real human head and they're thinking, you know, how in the world did it get here? Why hasn't anybody else seen this and taken it? Like, how are we the first ones to see this? And so they would end up calling the police, the police would come out, they'd gather up the skull, it would be sent in for testing, and sure enough, DNA testing would reveal the skull belonged to Devin Williams. No one has ever been able to explain what actually happened to Devin Williams, but the discovery of his skull inside of Tonto National Forest nearly guarantees that the driver of the truck two years earlier really was Devin, and the guy standing outside of the truck that was stuck in the mud in the meadow was likely Devin, and the guy throwing rocks at Jack and Lynn's car was Devin. People have put forth a whole host of theories about what happened to Devin, ranging from he had some sort of medical event where he kind of lost his mind and that's what caused all this strange behavior, or maybe Devin was on drugs despite not having any history of drug use, you know, maybe he took a really strong drug and that's what caused him to do all this. And still others believe that maybe there's a paranormal element to this whole story, that perhaps Devin was contacted by aliens and that's what induced all the bizarre behavior, and then ultimately he was abducted by said aliens, and then somehow his skull wound up back on this trail in the middle of Tonto National Forest. And as crazy as that sounds, still to this day, no one has any idea what happened to him, so that theory is just as good as any else. On the afternoon of June 6th, 1980, a 56-year-old man named Zygmunt Adamski, who just went by Ziggy, was having a late lunch with his wife and his cousin inside of Ziggy's little brick house in the English village of Tingley. That day had been a particularly stressful day for Ziggy and his family because the following day was Ziggy's goddaughter's wedding, and Ziggy was very close with his goddaughter. Ziggy and his wife couldn't have kids because of medical issues, and so his goddaughter had basically become at least in Ziggy's mind, like his own daughter. And so in fact, at her wedding, Ziggy was going to be walking her down the aisle. And while Ziggy was really excited about this, he was also very stressed out that he was going to screw it up. And so he had gone over and over, you know, what responsibilities he had as part of the wedding party. And he had this little speech he had to give that he had rehearsed 50 times. He had it written out. I mean, he was ready, but he was very much in his own head about something potentially going wrong that he would be responsible for. And on top of that stress, Ziggy had gotten into a fight that day with his cousin because he felt like the cousin was being kind of disrespectful in some way to his goddaughter. And so Ziggy had stepped up and defended his goddaughter to his cousin, and so there was this undercurrent of tension at the lunch table, not to mention this overarching stress that Ziggy was under about this wedding. And so as Ziggy and his cousin and his wife have this kind of tense meal, Ziggy suddenly realizes that he forgot to get potatoes when he went to the store earlier to buy ingredients for this meal, and for some reason, Ziggy decides, you know what, I'm going to just put my stuff down now, go to the store, and get those potatoes, even though at this point it was too late to make the potatoes for the meal and so maybe Ziggy just wanted to go out and do anything to get away from his cousin for a minute and away from all this wedding planning they were doing and just kind of go out and clear his head. And so Ziggy put his napkin down on the table, he stood up, he told his cousin and wife that he was going out to get potatoes. They were like, okay, and the cousin actually said, do you want me to come with you? You know, like, is there anything else you need to get while you're out? And Ziggy said, nope, I'm good. He grabbed some cash out of his wallet and he headed out the door. 
The village of Tingley, where Ziggy and his wife lived, was a very safe place. He and his wife had actually moved there after fleeing from Poland during World War II, where both Ziggy and his wife, whose name was Lottie, had been held prisoner at some point. And so after all this trauma of being held prisoner and having to flee their home country, they had looked for the safest, best place to kind of resettle and stay for good, and Tingley was it, and they loved it. Ziggy had gotten a job in Tingley as a coal miner, and he had been doing that for 27 years. As for Lottie, she didn't work because she had a disease called multiple sclerosis, which meant she was confined to a wheelchair. But Ziggy and Lottie had quickly made lots of friends in town who were very supportive, and so it wasn't long before Ziggy and Lottie had a very happy and stable life in this town. The little shop where Ziggy was going to was only about three blocks away from his house, which meant walking to the store, getting potatoes, and coming back would only take a few minutes. And so Lottie and the cousin back home, they expected to see Ziggy really come back within 10, 15 minutes. But when he didn't, and after about 30 minutes went by, Lottie actually got really concerned because Ziggy was just not the type of person to do stuff unannounced. He was incredibly methodical, he was very punctual and reliable, and so being late from this little trip to the store was just so uncharacteristic that Lottie told the cousin, hey, you go to the store and see if Ziggy is there, see what's going on here. Ziggy had worked in the coal mine for nearly 30 years, and he had some serious lung issues from breathing in all of the coal, and so Lottie was thinking, you know, maybe he collapsed or something along the way from these breathing issues. But when the cousin got to the shop, the shop owner told the cousin that they had seen Ziggy. He had come in about 25 minutes earlier, he had bought a bag of potatoes, seemed totally normal, everything was fine, and he had left walking back in the direction of his home. And so the cousin thanked the shopkeeper and then left and began jogging back towards Ziggy's house, thinking, you know, maybe he had just not seen him on the way, that maybe Ziggy was sitting down somewhere on this three block path path. But the cousin got all the way home and didn't see any sign of Ziggy. And so after going back inside of the house, the cousin and Lottie talked about what they should do. And they actually went back out into the neighborhood asking around, asking neighbors and other people if they had seen Ziggy. But after a couple of hours of canvassing the neighborhood and not finding Ziggy or finding any indication of what happened to him, Lottie ended up calling the police. But the police were not inclined to launch a huge investigation for a grown man who's only been missing for a couple of hours in his neighborhood with no sign of foul play or any other sign that anything really bad had happened. And after the police began asking questions of Lottie and the neighbors about what Ziggy's life was like, they learned that recently Ziggy had been declined for an early retirement from the coal mine. Because of those breathing issues he was having, he had requested to retire now, but they said no. And so Ziggy was really upset about that. He was really stressed about this wedding of his goddaughter the next day. He had been fighting with his cousin. Also, Ziggy was basically taking care of his wife, who's in this wheelchair all the time. And so because of all these stressors in Ziggy's life, the police started to wonder if maybe it was possible that Ziggy had not been going to get potatoes, but in fact was just kind of abandoning his family. And so ultimately, on the day that Ziggy went missing, the police told Lottie and Ziggy's cousin that they should just sit tight, see if he comes back tonight, and if he doesn't, go to the wedding tomorrow because Ziggy is so close with the goddaughter. If he's having some sort of issue right now, you know, he's very likely to come back for something as significant as this wedding. And so Lottie and Ziggy's cousin stayed at the house all night. Ziggy did not come back. They didn't hear from him. And the next day they went to the wedding, but Ziggy didn't show up for that either, even though he's supposed to walk his goddaughter down the aisle. And so after coming back from this wedding, Lottie called the police. She called local hospitals. She talked to all of her neighbors. I mean, she really put out like an all points bulletin to everybody in the area that something terrible has happened to Ziggy and we need to find him. But despite police beginning to lean into this and her neighbors really going out in force to try to find Ziggy, no one could find him. He had just vanished. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. 
Back in 2017, when I left the military, I really struggled to reintegrate back into society. But ironically, I didn't know I was struggling. I just assumed that the random bouts of anger and frustration and general dysphoria that I was feeling all the time were totally normal, and everybody else was dealing with these things too. It wasn't until my family came to me and said, John, we're really worried about you, that I finally kind of looked inward and realized there was an issue, and so I went out and got help. I got a therapist. And honestly, it changed my life. And now, today, in 2023, even though I would consider myself to be very well adjusted and happy, I still see a therapist because maintaining your mental health is just as important as maintaining your physical health. So if you are struggling right now, you're kind of caught in your own head and you're open to therapy, consider giving BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp is a highly reviewed online therapy platform, which means you can get the help you need right from the comfort of your own home. Get matched with a BetterHelp therapist after filling out a brief survey, and then it's up to you how you communicate, whether that's through text or chat or a phone call or video call or some combination. And if at any time you want to change your therapist, it's free free and easy to do so. Go to our sponsor, betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin for 10% off your first month of therapy with BetterHelp and get matched with a therapist who will listen and help. On the morning of June 11th, so five days after Ziggy went to get potatoes and then vanished, a man named Trevor Parker got to work at his father's coal yard in the English town of Todd Morton. The coal yard was basically just this big open lot that had a chain link fence around it that butted up against some railroad tracks. And inside of this lot were just these huge mounds of coal up against the perimeter of the lot. And then also inside of the coal yard was one small office building. And so on this morning, when Trevor pulled through the gates of this coal yard, first of all, he could see the entire yard the second he went in. And as he looked out, all he noticed was the fact that everything was wet from an early morning storm. And so after just kind of surveying around the lot to make sure none of the coal got blown around from the storm, he made his way to the small office building to do some paperwork. Trevor would work inside of that office building for a while, and then around lunchtime, Trevor decided to just go and get some lunch and kind of have a nice long lunch break. And so he left, he went to the pub, he was there for a couple of hours, and then around 3.45 p.m., he came back to the coal yard, and when he went through the gates, everything looked the same, except there was this dark thing on top of one of the coal piles in the back of the yard. Now, Trevor didn't know if he had seen it when he had first arrived that morning or if it was new, but whatever it was on this pile, it immediately caught Trevor's attention. And so after parking his vehicle, Trevor began walking over to this 12 foot tall coal pile with this thing on it. And when he got about 30 feet away from it, he realized he saw someone's shoe, that this dark figure was a person. And right away, Trevor started rolling his eyes because there was a group of homeless people that lived near the railroad tracks just outside of the coal yard. And it wasn't uncommon for them to get really drunk and then wander their way into the coal yard where sometimes they would fall asleep. And so Trevor's thinking, okay, clearly one of these drunk homeless people has found their way into the coal yard and they've passed out on top of this pile of coal. And so instead of going over and talking to this person directly, Trevor just turned around, went back inside of the office building, and he called for an ambulance. The ambulance arrived a few minutes later. They did not have their sirens on. They didn't come flying into the yard. This was a routine thing they were doing. They were scooping up a drunk and bringing them back to the hospital. And so when the medics got out of their ambulance and Trevor directed them over to the proper coal pile, they were just cracking jokes along the way. This was not a big deal. When the two medics got to the bottom of the coal pile, one of them began climbing up the coal to go see this drunk person and get them down. And so Trevor, as this is happening, he walked a little bit closer. And when he did, he realized that the person who had fallen asleep on the coal, they had really nice pants on, like tailored pants. They were certainly not what Trevor expected this person to be wearing. But before Trevor could even really react to the clothes this person had on, 
the medic who had climbed up had finally reached this person. They reached down and began trying to move the person around. And suddenly, when they had manipulated this person's body enough, the medic's facial expression completely changed. They went from somewhat routine to totally horrified. And they backed off of this person on the coals. They turned around and ran down the coal, practically falling over themselves. And when they got down there, Trevor heard the medic say to his partner, call the police, call the police right now. And Trevor said, what's going on? What, what did you see? And the medic who had reacted that way just shook his head and walked away to kind of compose himself. And so Trevor at this point was starting to get spooked himself. Clearly, whatever the medic had just seen had really shaken him up. And so Trevor just kind of stood there while the other medic ran in and called police. And then a few minutes later, a police car came flying into the coal yard and an officer named Alan Godfrey, along with his partner, got out of the car. And right away, the medic who had gone to the top of the pile and been freaked out by what he saw, walked over with a very ashen face. And he told Alan Godfrey that something was terribly wrong with the person on top of this pile. And so Alan, not really sure what to expect, walked over with his partner to this coal pile and with the medics and Trevor standing back, Alan, on his own, climbed up the coal and he looked down at this person. And what Alan saw was a man lying on his stomach wearing a beautiful three-piece brown suit and Alan immediately noticed that there was absolutely no soot from the coal that this guy was laying on on his suit even though Alan, just to get up here, had basically covered himself in black soot. And so he was wondering, how did this guy get up here and not get covered in soot? It didn't make any sense. Also, Alan noticed that this guy's hair looked totally bizarre. It looked like someone had given him like a really bad haircut with dull scissors. Like they just grabbed tufts of his hair and kind of chopped randomly. I mean, his hair was kind of all over the place. There were bald spots. And then as Alan looked from this guy's hair down, he noticed almost hidden in his hairline was this fairly deep wound in the back of his neck that was still bleeding but there was this weird green jelly-like substance very obviously placed over this wound. And Alan had no idea what the substance was. But as weird as all that was, that didn't explain why the first medic had basically completely panicked and run away. When Alan tried to roll this guy over onto his back to try to wake him up and see if he was okay, he rolled him over and Alan got a look at this guy's face. And immediately Alan let go of him and kind of had to step back for a second because the guy's face was contorted in this frozen look of absolute terror. His jaw was open so wide. It was almost like his lower jaw was dislocated and his teeth were baring and his eyes were bulging out of his head. And so Alan quickly realized that obviously this was not just some drunk homeless person who passed out here. This was a dead person. And whatever happened to them must have been unbelievably terrifying to leave someone looking like that in their death pose. It would turn out this deceased man in the coal yard was Ziggy Adamski. But this did not solve the mystery of what happened to Ziggy five days earlier. In fact, his discovery really only created more questions. This town where this coal yard was, Todd Morden, was located 25 miles away from where Ziggy lived. And as far as anyone knew, Ziggy didn't know anybody in Todd Morden. So there was no reason for him to be there. And number two, when he had left to go get potatoes, he had been on foot. So did he walk 25 miles to this random town? Also, assuming he did just walk to this coal yard, this coal yard is a big, wide open lot that if you were standing anywhere near it, even outside the fence, you could look in and basically see the entire place. So it just seemed really unlikely that Ziggy could just walk into this very public open space and get to the top of one of these coal piles without somebody noticing him, whether that was Trevor or one of the other employees that were there or one of the truck drivers that were in and out of there all the time, all day doing deliveries or the homeless people who were near the railroad tracks or the people who rode the trains that passed by there every single day. I mean, there are a lot of eyes on this coal yard, but nobody saw Ziggy. It was like he just kind of appeared at the top of this pile. And again, even if Ziggy had managed to slip in and sneak to the top of this pile, why didn't he have soot from the coal all over his clothes? 
And if maybe he had been brought there, if someone had killed him and put him on this coal pile, there's even more reason he would have soot all over him because they would have had to drag him up to the top of the pile. And even putting all that aside, if someone really did kill Ziggy and they placed him on this pile, why? This is a very open public place. Someone is going to find him. You're going to get caught if you're the killer. And then, of course, there is the issue of what Ziggy was wearing. That brown three-piece suit he was wearing that had no soot on it, it wasn't his, and it wasn't put on right. The buttons were not lined up. It almost looked like somebody else who didn't know how to put a suit on had tried to dress Ziggy. And then Ziggy also did not have an undershirt on. It was just the jacket over his skin. And then also Ziggy had this totally bizarre haircut that looked like someone who didn't know how to give a haircut had cut his hair with scissors and said, you know, good enough. And then of course you have this wound on the back of Ziggy's neck. Now the wound itself was determined not to be fatal. It was a fairly deep cut, but it wouldn't have killed him. However, the most significant part of that wound was that green jelly that had been placed across the back of it. During Ziggy's autopsy, they were unable to figure out what this green jelly was, and they ran dozens and dozens of tests on it. And also, during the autopsy, the coroner would determine that Ziggy had actually died the same day he had been found. So he was doing something for five days between going missing and being on this coal pile, but nobody knows what it was. And as for his cause of death, the coroner was not entirely sure, but it did seem like he died of a heart attack. The coroner would search all of Ziggy's body for signs of some sort of fight he might have gotten into, some sort of defensive wound on his body, but there was nothing. However, the coroner did find there were very small burns on the back of his neck that were caused by acid, but it was unclear how those got there. When they inspected Ziggy's stomach, they determined that he had been eating and drinking regularly, and so he was not malnourished, he was not dehydrated, he was relatively healthy when he died. He just had this heart attack for unknown reasons, and apparently whatever gave him the heart attack scared him so badly, his face contorted in that horrible way. Ultimately, the coroner just kind of gave up and ruled that Ziggy had died of natural causes, and then the case was closed. But to this day, no one really has any idea how Ziggy went from going out to get groceries to winding up 25 miles away, dressed differently with this haircut, with this jelly on him and acid burns, dead with this horrible look on his face on this coal pile. It doesn't make any sense. This case has become very famous because people say it is the best example of alien abduction that Ziggy had left his house to get groceries, got abducted by aliens, and then over five days, you know, these aliens did stuff to Ziggy, including cutting into his neck and dropping acid on him, and then they put that green stuff on the back of his neck, they dressed him the way they thought people dressed in a suit, but they didn't really do it right, and then they literally just dropped him on top of this coal pile, which would explain why he didn't have soot all over him. He was dead, they dropped him, and he just landed on the top of the coal pile. And even if you think that's totally totally far-fetched. Keep in mind, still today, we do not know what that green jelly compound was on the back of his neck. It's literally never been identified, and people have been trying to figure it out for 40 plus years. Also, it's worth noting that one of the responding police officers, Alan Godfrey, claimed to have seen a UFO within weeks of finding Ziggy Adamski. One afternoon in December of 1986, a woman named Shanti Singh was sitting on her bed cradling her toddler son, whose name was Titu, as he threw a huge temper tantrum. Titu, who was three years old, had already been throwing this tantrum for about 30 minutes at this point, and it didn't seem like anything Shanti did was getting him to calm down. In fact, honestly, it just seemed like Titu was getting worse and worse by the second. And Shanti knew her son's constant wailing must be annoying her neighbors in the little rural village in northern India where they lived. But again, Shanti just felt like really there was nothing she could do. After all, this was not a typical toddler tantrum. Titu was not throwing this tantrum because he lost a toy or was fighting with his siblings or something. No, the reality was Shanti and her husband had no idea why Titu was throwing this tantrum because Titu threw these tantrums all the time for seemingly no reason and nothing they did would get him to stop. He would just start throwing these crazy fits and he would only stop when he was ready. Now, Shanti and her husband had taken Titu to the local doctor, and he'd been examined, and the doctor said, look, I think your son's just fine. I can't find anything wrong with him. So whatever's causing him to be so upset, it's got to be psychological. 
Shanti grabbed her son and tried to give him a hug and kiss to get him to calm down. But as she did that, you know, Titu turned around and tried to hit her in the face and kicked her and punched her. And so Shanti had to kind of fall back on the bed. And Titu, at this point, who's still throwing this huge tantrum, he leapt off the bed and ran out of the room. Now, Shanti had already sent the rest of her family, her kids, her husband, outside to wait out this current T2 tantrum. And so for a second, Shanti thought about just laying on the bed and letting her crazy toddler just kind of run around the house until he was done throwing this tantrum. But as Shanti was laying there on the bed, practically crying from frustration, she heard a plate break in the kitchen. And so she jumped up and ran into the kitchen and there was T2 looking down at the ground where there was a shattered plate on the ground. Clearly T2 had smashed it on purpose. And so as furious as Shanti was, she suddenly realized that, you know, nothing she could do was gonna get this kid to stop. And so right now, the only thing she could do was just put him in a safe place where he couldn't hurt other people or himself or damage anything else. And so Shanti, trying to be as calm as possible, walked up to Titu, who's still throwing this tantrum and swinging at her as she's coming near him. And she grabbed him, she turned him around so he couldn't kick her or punch her. She put him into his room and then shut the door. And then she sat down in the hallway with her back up against the door to keep it shut. And then as Titu inside the room began banging on the door and trying to open it, you know, Shanti's sitting there anchoring the door and she's just praying that her son's gonna calm down soon. And then at some point, Shanti heard her son start to say something that typically signaled the end of a tantrum. Titu in the bedroom began saying the word Shirsh Verma, which actually was a nonsense word that Shanti and her husband and the other kids had no idea what it meant. But, you know, Titu, at the end of his tantrums, he would always just start saying over and over again, Shirsh Verma, Shirsh Verma, Shirsh Verma. And so Shanti, she's in the hall and she's hearing Titu start to do that. And so on the one hand, she's thinking, okay, you know, this tantrum's about to end. But on the other, she's like, I have no idea what that word means. You know, it's obviously connected in some way to what's going on with my son, but I have no idea what it means. It sounds like nonsense. And so Shanti began yelling through the door at Titu to explain what Shirsh Verma meant but T2 had no explanation. He just kept saying the word over and over again. Shirsh Verma, Shirsh Verma, Shirsh Verma. Shanti and her husband had five other kids. T2 was the youngest and T2 was not like any of his other siblings. The other siblings did not throw temper tantrums like this, not at all. And in fact, T2 had been a difficult child even before he was born. Towards the end of Shanti's pregnancy with Titu, she'd become very, very sick, and in fact, had to be hospitalized for the entire last trimester. And then as a newborn baby, Titu basically didn't sleep at all, and he cried constantly. And so Shanti and her husband initially thought, you know, Titu must just be a very fussy baby. But in time, you know, as he grew into more of a toddler, it was clear to Shanti and her husband that Titu was actually a different kind of kid. He seemed like a very unhappy and kind of angry kid who was permanently on the verge of crying or throwing a fit. But it wasn't until T2 began talking at around two years old that Shanti and her husband really started to become worried because the things T2 was saying as a two-year-old were just not in keeping with what you would expect a two-year-old to say. And I'm not talking about the nonsense word that T2 would use during his temper tantrums, Shirsh Verma. Basically, T2 would say things that seemed to indicate that he genuinely hated everyone in his family. Now, for context, Shanti and her family were not poor, but they weren't rich either. They lived in a little concrete home, they didn't have a TV or a car, and all the kids wore hand-me-down clothes, and Shanti actually handmade her clothes and her husband's clothes. But the family always had enough food to eat, and they were educated, and they seemed happy enough. It's just that they didn't really have the ability to do anything extra, like above and beyond a modest life. And T2 had never known anything different. This was his life from the day he was born. But when he learned to speak at around two years old, it was like all T2 wanted to talk about was how crappy of a lifestyle their family lived. For example, when T2's mom, Shanti, would put on one of her saris that happened to be ripped, a sari is a traditional garment in India, T2 would look at what she was wearing and in toddler speak, you know, he would tell her that she looked terrible and that it looked like she was just wearing rags. T2 would also walk around their house and he would point to spots in the house that looked dirty and he would demand that somebody cleaned it up because he didn't want to live in a dirty house. And then whenever the family needed to go somewhere and they would walk there or take the bus there, T2 would complain the entire time that he wanted to be in a car. And why aren't we driving in a car? Like, why are we walking? Despite the fact that T2 basically had never used a car before. 
But perhaps the strangest aspect of Tidu's behavior was around the time he began talking and insulting his family, he also began talking about this very historic city called Agra, which was located about eight miles away from where they lived. Agra was famous for being home to the Taj Mahal, which is considered to be one of the most beautiful buildings ever made. Agra also has a very busy downtown and lots of tourism, but Titu had never been to Agra, and there was no reason he would be drawn to Agra, like his family had no connection to that city. But starting around the time Titu began talking at two years old, he began asking to go to Agra several times a week. And when his parents would say, no, we're not gonna go to Agra, Titu would throw a huge tantrum. And so not long after Titu had begun speaking and saying all these terrible things, Shanti and her husband decided that really all they could do was just wait and hope their son grew out of this terrible behavior. But Titu did not grow out of this. Shortly after his parents decided to just kind of wait it out, Titu would randomly attack another small child with a sugar cane, and he beat the kid so badly the kid was bleeding at the end of the attack. And then also another time, shortly after the sugar cane beating, Titu was at the store with his mother, and his mom was looking at this bracelet, which she couldn't afford. She was just looking at it through the glass, and Titu sensed his mom wanted the bracelet, and in an odd show of affection for his mother, he turned to the shopkeeper, this little tiny kid who's not even three years old yet, and he tells the shopkeeper that if he doesn't give this bracelet to his mother for free, that Titu will shoot and kill the shopkeeper. And so after this, Shanti and her husband just stopped taking Titu out in public at all. It was just too embarrassing. But what really just unsettled Shanti the most about her son's behavior was that nonsense word that Titu kept saying at the end of all of his tantrums, Shersh Verma, Shersh Verma. And so fast forward to that day after he's broken the plate and now Shanti's put him in his room, Titu began saying that nonsense word, except he was getting a little bit older and his speech was getting a little bit more clear. And so as Shanti was laying up against the door, she realized that her son was not saying a single word, Shersh Verma, he was saying two words. They were Suresh Verma. But Shanti had no idea what that meant. She thought it sounded like a name, but it was a name she had never heard before. But one day, a few months after the dishbreaking incident, in April of 1987, all of Titu's very strange, erratic, terrible behaviors would erupt all at once. That April day started out like any other. Shanti made breakfast for her family, and then her husband headed out to do some errands, and her six children kind of dispersed around the inside and outside of the house to play, study, whatever. But Titu was really grouchy, and so he stayed inside in the kitchen with Shanti. A little while later, Shanti's oldest son came into the kitchen and he asked his mother, hey, when will dad get back from his trip to Agra? Shanti's husband had gone to Agra to run one of his chores and Agra was the city that Titu was totally obsessed with. And so when Shanti's oldest son said the word Agra, Titu, who was sitting in the kitchen, he heard it and kind of looked up like he was totally fixated on their conversation. And then as Shanti and her oldest were talking about the dad, Titu just got up, left the kitchen, and he went to his room. He grabbed a couple of things, and then he came back into the kitchen carrying this bundle of clothes with him. And he walked right past his brother and his mother. He went out the front door and began running down the road without saying a word. Remember, this is like a three-year-old child. This is not a teenager. This is a little kid. And so Shanti and her oldest son, they kind of watched in shock as Titu ran off down the road. And for a minute, neither of them did anything. And then it was like they broke out of their trance and the oldest son just turned and began running out of the house to catch up with Titu. Now, it didn't take long for the oldest to catch up with his young brother, but it was surprisingly hard to stop Titu from trying to run away. He fought back as hard as he could to keep his brother from pulling him back to the house. And then when the older brother got Titu back inside, Shanti looked at her older son and she saw he had a black eye from where Titu had just hit him. And when Shanti turned to Titu to try to get him to apologize to his brother for hitting him, she saw Titu was completely inconsolable. He was throwing a huge temper tantrum. He was on the ground kicking and flailing and screaming at the top of his lungs. And so Shanti and her oldest son knew there was no hope in getting him to calm down. He was deep into one of his tantrums. And so Shanti and the oldest just basically restrained Titu so he couldn't hurt himself or one of them or damage anything. And for a while, as they held him to the ground, Titu just continued to scream and flail and throw this fit. 
But eventually he did kind of calm down and he began saying Suresh Verma, Suresh Verma over and over again. But then he began talking about something that he really hadn't brought up before that stood out to Shanti and her oldest son. T2, in addition to saying periodically Suresh Verma, Suresh Verma, also began talking about some radio store in Agra. And T2 kept saying, why didn't dad bring me to the radio store? Why didn't he bring me? And so as Shanti is listening to her son, she suddenly thinks, you know what? This is my chance. He's being so specific about this radio store. You know, maybe this is my opportunity to lean in and learn what the heck is going on with my kid. And so once T2 fully stopped his temper tantrum and Shanti and her oldest could finally let go of him, once T2 had left the room, Shanti turned to her oldest son and she told him to go to Agra right now, just go there and look for a radio store or something. Look for anything that could be a clue to what's going on with Titu. He obviously has some fixation with the city. Just go, look around, see if you can find something. So the oldest son left the house and he went to one of his friend's houses who had a car and together they drove into Agra. Now, Shanti had no idea if her oldest son's trip to Agra would produce anything useful, but she figured, you know, she's got nothing to lose. A few hours later, when Shanti's oldest son returned from Agra, he came into their home with a very serious look on his face. And right away, Shanti could tell, clearly, he's discovered something. And so Shanti asked her oldest son, you know, tell me, what did you learn? What happened in Agra? And the oldest son, you know, he looked down for a second, and then he looked back at his mom and he just said, tomorrow, we're gonna have visitors. Are you a fan of The Strange, Dark, and Mysterious? If so, then you're in luck. Because our massively popular show, The Mr. Ballin Podcast, which since the end of 2022 has been exclusively on the Amazon Music platform, is now available on all podcast platforms, and it's free. There are over 200 episodes in the back catalog of this show. And of those 200, at least half of them have never been told on YouTube. They are only available on the podcast. And you can find those exclusive episodes by looking for the words podcast exclusive in the individual episode title. So again, the highly popular Mr. Ballin podcast is once again available on all podcast platforms and it is free. To listen, just search for the Mr. Ballin podcast on Amazon Music or wherever else you get your podcasts and then give the show a follow and then start your binge. Oh, and also, if you are one of the amazing people who subscribed to Amazon Music to follow the Mr. Ballin podcast when it went exclusive, don't give up your membership just yet because there are still huge perks for listening to the show on Amazon Music. With your Prime membership, you can listen to new episodes of the Mr. Ballin podcast 30 days early and ad-free on Amazon Music. But again, the show is now available on all podcast platforms and it really is free. So thank you so much. Have a nice binge. The next day, a car pulled up in front of Shanti's home and six people climbed out. There was a woman wearing a beautiful red sari who appeared to be in her 30s, and then there were three other men who also appeared to be in their 30s, and they were all wearing suits and jackets. And there was also an older couple, a man and a woman, and the man was wearing this beautiful sweater, and the woman had on all this silk. It was clear just from the way they looked that these six people were not from this area. They were from somewhere else, and they had a ton of money. Now, Shanti was inside the house and she was watching this group arrive, but she did not go outside to greet them. She, her husband, and all of her kids, minus Titu, had decided the night before when they knew these visitors were gonna arrive that they wouldn't go out and talk to them. Instead, they would just allow Titu to basically make first contact with these people and see what happens. So when Shanti saw this group of six very well-off people were standing right outside of their gate, kind of waiting to be let in, she called for Titu and said, hey, go outside and open the gate for our guests. And so Titu, who was not throwing a fit at this point, he came running through the house and he went to the door. He's not looked outside yet. He opens up the door and he runs outside and he sees these six people on the other side of the gate. And suddenly Shanti heard Titu make a sound that he never made. It was like the sound of pure joy joy. He was so elated to see these six people. Shanti couldn't believe it. For a second, Shanti closed her eyes and almost started crying because she knew even before Titu had made that joyous sound when he saw these people, they were about to solve the mystery of what was going on with her son. Just then, Shanti heard Titu from outside yelling for Shanti and the rest of his family to come outside and meet his other family. 
Shanti went to the door and gestured for the guests to come inside, and then she led them through the house to the back deck, and then after they were all seated, Shanti looked over at her son, Titu, and she saw he had this huge grin on his face, he was so happy, and he was staring intently at the woman who got out of the car, who was in her 30s and wearing the beautiful red sari, and she was sitting right across the table from Titu, and Titu is just locked on her. Now, at this point, nobody is speaking. Everybody is just sitting there. No introductions have been made, so nobody even knows each other's names. And in this kind of tense and awkward silence, Titu, who again is just staring at this woman in red, he eventually breaks the silence, the three-year-old child, and he asks the woman in red to come sit next to him. And so the woman in the red sari, she does what he asks and moves over and sits next to the toddler. And then Titu looked up at her and he smiled and he said, do you know who I am? And the woman, she's looking down at him and she said, no, I don't. And Titu would look back up at her and he would say, I know who you are, you're Uma. And at this, the woman in red, whose name really was Uma, she gasped. She had no idea how this kid knew who she was. But before she could even say anything, Titu continued. And he said to her, hey, do you remember when we went to the fair with Ranu and Sanu and I bought you those sweets? And at this, the woman in the red sari, Uma, she had this new look come over her face. Instead of looking like she was just kind of shocked and appalled that this random kid knew who she was, now it was like a look of shocked recognition as she's looking down at Titu, like she suddenly understood what was actually going on. And at the same time, Titu's mother, Shanti, was watching this happen and she was kind of piecing together what was really going on here and suddenly she realized she needed to check something. And she got up and she ran out of the room and she came back with scissors. And without saying anything, Shanti went straight to Titu, she pushed his head to the side, exposing his right ear, and she used those scissors and began cutting all the hair off his head that was kind of drooped over his right ear, kind of exposing the right side of his skull. And as the hair on Titu's head fell to the ground, exposing more and more of the right side of his head, all the adults watching just gasped. And the whole time, Titu was just smiling. To understand what just happened out on that back porch between these random people and Shanti and her family, you need some context. So here's what happened when Shanti's oldest son was sent to Agra to go investigate and look for clues that could explain what was going on with Titu. The brother and his friend had driven all around Agra, you know, looking for radio stores and looking for things that might in some way kind of connect to Titu, and they didn't see anything. But at some point, they drove past one of the many radio stores in Agra, and the name of this radio store immediately stood out to the brother and this friend. So the older brother and the friend, they parked their car and they went in to this particular radio shop and inside of there is where they met Uma, the woman who had the red sari on, who was in her 30s, that Titu said we went to the fair together with, that woman. So she's inside this radio shop and when the older brother asked Uma how this radio shop got its name, that was when things began to fall into place for this older brother about what was going on with Titu. Uma would tell the older brother that this radio shop actually belonged to her husband, except three and a half years ago, he was murdered, he was shot and killed, and so she had been running the shop ever since. And Uma said she had considered changing the name of the shop, you know, since taking it over, but she just couldn't bring herself to change it because the shop's name was actually based on her husband's name. The name of the shop was Suresh Radio Shop. Her husband's name was Suresh Verma the two words that Titu would say all the time at the end of his tantrums, Suresh Verma, Suresh Verma. That was Uma's husband. And it would turn out the details of Suresh's death matched up in a very bizarre way with Titu's birth. And all of Titu's totally erratic, strange, terrible behavior throughout really his entire life to this point now suddenly made sense if you knew about Suresh's life. Many people, including professors from major universities in India and America, have come to believe that what happened with Titu was when Suresh was murdered, his spirit somehow came out of his body and entered Titu's body. Basically, Suresh was reincarnated in Titu. This reincarnation theory would explain why Titu was always saying Suresh Verma, because in theory that was his real name, you know, that's the guy who died, who then his spirit transitioned to Titu, so he's saying his name over and over again. And then also Titu's obsession with Agra would make sense, because that's where Suresh's radio shop was and where he lived. 
Also, the reincarnation theory would explain why Titu was so critical of Shanti and the rest of his family's lifestyle, basically accusing them of being poor and kind of living below his station. Well, Suresh's family was very, very wealthy, and so that was the lifestyle Suresh had lived. And so if his spirit was now in Titu's body, he might be at odds with their lifestyle. And lastly, the reincarnation theory would explain the two very unique and very pronounced birthmarks that T2 had right next to his right ear. He had one right above his right ear and right below it. Now, these were birthmarks that Shanti was well aware of, but after she learned about how Suresh Verma was killed, he was shot in the side of his head and the bullet went in above his right ear and then came out on the bottom part of his right ear, right here. When she heard that, she ran and got the scissors. She cut the hair away around Titu's ear, revealing the two birthmarks. And then the other families saw those birthmarks and they're like, oh my goodness, that is literally where the entry and exit wounds were on Suresh. And then also it's worth pointing out that on the day Suresh was shot and killed, well, basically that day was when Titu's mother, Shanti, began feeling really sick during her pregnancy with Titu and she had to be hospitalized. After this discovery about Titu and Suresh Verma, Shanti and her husband and the rest of her family expected Titu to want to live with Uma and his other family. And at first, that is what Titu wanted to do, but pretty quickly he actually decided that, you know what, I want to stay put with the family I was born into and we can just visit with the other family. And so that's what they did. You know, Uma and the other wealthy family, they made visits all the time to see T2 and vice versa. You know, the families got along great. And as for T2, you know, he was really happy. You know, his bad behavior basically went away and he became a normal high functioning kid. And T2 has grown up and become a very happy and successful adult. He's got a family of his own and he's currently a professor at a college in India. In the very early morning hours of December 26, 1980, Airman Steve Longaro was on a foot patrol at the Royal Air Force Base near Rendlesham Forest in the UK. And as Longaro walked along, suddenly this alarm sounded across the base. And based on the sound of this alarm, Longaro knew this was not a drill. And so instinctively he turned and began sprinting towards his assigned firing position right along the perimeter of the base. And as Longaro ran towards his position, he looked around him and he saw hundreds of of other soldiers doing the exact same thing. But once Longaro actually reached his firing position and looked out, you know, looking for the threat that's coming into the base, he realized he didn't see anything. But then when he turned to look at his colleagues to ask them, you know, what's going on here, he noticed everybody else was not even looking outside the base. They were kind of looking off to the side towards Rendlesham Forest because there was something out there kind of hovering in the trees that was casting this very eerie red light over everything. And this was just the beginning of what would go on to be one of the most credible and unsettling paranormal events in history. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds more stories just like this one, many of which are only on the podcast. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music. Journey
Last weekend, I looked over and I saw old Seagull Lung sitting at his miniature 1999 era G3 iMac, and I couldn't help but notice he was looking a little downtrodden. And when I saw what he was doing on his iMac, I knew why. He was hitting refresh over and over and over again on his MySpace page, and it wasn't changing the numbers. Old Lung hasn't had a view on his MySpace page since 2010. To cheer him up, I decided I would purchase a MySpace view bot and flood his page with tens of views. So I ran over to my windmill-powered laptop and began slapping away at the keys to navigate to an online vendor that sold MySpace view bots. However, as soon as I clicked on the link, www this website is a virus, not an online vendor for MySpaceViewBots.com, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. Unbelievably, that website was riddled with malware, and so immediately, my windmill-powered laptop caught on fire and then exploded, sending shrapnel raining down on me. Luckily, all along was in the other room, and he heard the commotion, and he leapt into the room, and he pushed me out of the way just in time. And then after the dust had settled, old Lung gave me a big hug, and then slapped me right in the anti-tragus and said Papa, when du standig auf gefährliche Website klickst, dann brauchst du NordVPN. Which of course in German means, Papa, if you're going to keep clicking on dangerous websites, then use NordVPN. And boy was all lucky right. <laughs> A VPN, or Virtual Private Network, is a service that keeps you safe when you browse the internet. And NordVPN is the brand name in the VPN space. Not only will NordVPN keep your data safely behind their wall of next-generation encryption, but also, most importantly, they will block malware-hosting websites and annoying pop-up ads and botnet control. So, if your online shopping seems to always turn into explosions and other various catastrophes caused by malware-hosted websites, then you need to take old Lungy's advice too and sign up for NordVPN today. Right now, you can sign up for a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus get four additional months for free when you go to nordvpn.com slash MrBallin. And it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash MrBallin, or click the link in the description below. Okay, back to the story. I want to create a mildly effective... <laughs> mildly effective... <laughs> I want to make a mildly effective cold medicine made exclusively out of Egyptian fire ants. <gasps> Take its horn off its head and you beat it to death. <laughs> Say go! Lung! Die. You. You die. <laughs> Turned and leapt head first out the glass window. <laughs> Bow! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Got up on its flippers and began chasing us down the cave. <laughs> a nice hot thigh mug of musk. <laughs> and we settled on a piping hot plate up. <laughs> piping hot plate of eagle tonsils, your smoked chicken gallbladder eggnog, your zebra cornea souffle. Get to go surfing. <laughs> surfing. But it did No! Yes, it did. Papa, you dois avoir. Papa, tu dois avoir. Lungy was already in there, and he looks at me, and he says, Papaye, deberiamos terrificado com hello fresh. Oh, Lungy, he put on... <laughs> It's not even funny. If you're wondering why I just shared a whole slew of me just butchering my various intros and different parts of strange, dark, and mysterious videos, well, it's because you all asked for it. Last month, in our first ever Mr. Ball and Newsletter, we posed a question. We said, what do you want me to share with you the most? And overwhelmingly, what you all wanted to see was a compilation of bloopers. And you don't want to miss the next newsletter because maybe there's something else you want to see, and that newsletter might give you a chance to actually see that thing happening. And also, remember, the newsletter encompasses basically everything we're up to, both things that are coming up in the future, things that you might have missed, what we're doing now, and it's designed to be really easy to consume. It's very visual. It's not all text. Like, it's very beautiful. It's an incredibly good newsletter. And so to sign up, all you got to do is go to ballinstudios.com and input your email, and boom, you're signed up. Also, you can just click the link in the description below. That will also get you signed up for the newsletter. And then we will deliver it to you, you know, once a month, and boom, there you go. You're in the know. 
So thank you to all the people who have already signed up. And in advance, thank you so much to those that are about to go sign up. And I'm sorry to those that plan to not sign up because really, you're missing out. And you know what? See Gollum? He's going to be pretty disappointed in you. So there's that too. Okay, peer pressure. Go get it done. Ballinstudios.com. Sign up for our incredible monthly newsletter. Thank you so much. See ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is probably just another ad for cheap cigarettes for my pet dolphin. But no, it's not. Don't worry. This ad is for all my good, honest, hardworking people that just want to kick back and relax and purchase a high-quality rabid turtle to send to the like button without being interrupted by disgusting pesky pop-up ads. If you're living this pop-up nightmare right now, then today is your lucky day because NordVPN exists. A VPN or virtual private network is a service that keeps you safe when you browse the internet. And NordVPN is the brand name in the VPN space. Not only will NordVPN ensure that all your data remains behind their wall of next generation encryption, but also, most importantly, through their latest feature, threat protection, they will automatically block all those disgusting pop-up ads that have been destroying your opportunity to buy a quality rab Turret. NordVPN's threat protection will also protect you from malicious sites, trackers, and downloads. So, you can either go waste your money on any of the hundreds of so-called deals out there for cheap dolphin cigarettes, as if that exists, or you can be a big dog, sign up for NordVPN, and buy an infinite number of quality rab turts without interruption. Talk about a no-brainer. Currently, the best deal for NordVPN is through my YouTube offer. Right now, NordVPN is offering viewers an exclusive two-year plan at a huge discount, plus an additional month free when you go to nordvpn.com slash MrBallin. And it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash MrBallin, or click the link in the description below. Okay, back to the story.